This building behind me, there's less than two dozen buildings built to this standard in the entire world. We're coming to you from Hampshire College where this building is a Living Building Challenge certified building. You know, we think sometimes of very efficient buildings like a net zero building. This building goes way beyond that. Today's build show all about the RW Kern Center, sponsored by Hampshire College. Let's get going. Okay, y'all, we're at Hampshire College in Massachusetts, and I've got with me Sarah Draper, the director of the RW Kern Center. Sarah, amazing building. I told these guys already, this is when this was built in 2016, only the 17th building in the world to get that living building challenge status. Yeah. But Sarah, what is the Living Building Challenge? Give us an overview. Yeah, all right, good question. So Living Building Challenge is a building certification system like LEED, like Passive House. Um, and it's asking the question, what does a good building look like? What does mm -hmm. it take to build a building that's good for people and good for the environment? Okay. Um, and it breaks that down into these seven categories or seven pedals. So some things you probably think about all the time, um, energy, net zero energy, mm -hmm. uh, looking at water and water conservation, materials, what is the building built out of, and then things that you may not have thought about. So health and happiness. How do we make a building that's healthy for people? Mm -hmm. um, Equity, how do we make a building that is accessible and available to everybody? And even things like beauty. It's a requirement that we create a beautiful building that people want to be in. Um, it's and then, a pretty holistic deal here. Yeah. This is, you know, I've built some net zero houses before, but that's only one of the seven pedals, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, living building challenge is really asking you, how do you do all of that at once? Um, with the idea that we, you know, we don't have to just build less bad. We can actually build a building that is good, positive, has a positive impact on people and the environments. And the way to do that is to do all of this at once, looking at it holistically. I love it. Let's break down for these guys, Sarah, the seven pedals a little bit. So yeah. let's start with the easy one, energy efficiency. Yeah. What are some of the things that you did for energy efficiency and ultimately to achieve that net zero on this building? Yeah, so, I mean, you're familiar with net zero energy and the, the mantra which we totally used on this building is reduce first. So mm -hmm. what can you do to reduce your energy loads? So, you know, really efficient wall systems. Our walls are our 40, our roof is our 60. Um, you know, we have triple glazed windows. We have a bunch of different shading devices. You know, you can see our exterior shades yeah. here. So all of those things intended to reduce our energy footprint. And then we can make up the difference with solar on the roof. And our whole rooftop here is covered with solar tilting towards us here on the south side. Yeah, you got a pretty big array up there, oh, like do. 120 kW, 118. 118. Yeah. And so what's interesting about this Living Building Challenge too, though, is that you've taken a year of actual use here on the campus and said, okay, did we actually meet these standards? And that's a pretty interesting part of this program. It's not just a checkbox which uh, is sometimes the uh, the gig on some of the programs out there that, oh, I checked the box, I put a bike rack in front of the building, so I made my green building standard. Right. There's a little bit of this performance versus prescriptive. Will you talk about that for a second? Yeah, it's pretty hard to phone it in on a living building project. So exactly that, what, exactly what you just said, it's performance based. So, you know, we have this goal of being net zero energy. If we look at the energy pedal and at the end of construction, we start that clock and we need a year's worth of energy use and energy project production data to prove that, yeah, we actually are producing more energy or as much energy as we need. Yep. Um, and that's a that's a huge deal. As you probably know, that testing and commissioning period, super crucial. That is a big deal. And while we're thinking about this real quick, Sarah allowed me on the tour earlier to actually get up in the attic and see a couple of those systems. Let me cut real quick to the attic. Oh yeah, you know I love my mechanical rooms. So we are at the top of the building now. And Christopher, the architect, tells me that this right here, this plywood you're seeing, this is the interior air barrier. This is uh, probably half inch plywood with some Huber zip tape to make it airtight. And then above us, we've got a maybe two or three foot cavity that's filled with cellulose. So we're R60 at the roof line above us here ish. Some some parts are actually deeper than that. But what's cool about this is this is how I saw buildings all over Europe being built using plywood as the interior vapor retarder and the air barrier makes a lot of sense because this plywood can actually absorb some of the moisture in the air and give it off depending on you know time of year 
climate, all that kind of thing. It's also really easy to source, right? We can get this, this uh, BC plywood, CDX plywood anywhere, which is really cool. And zip tape also really easy to source. Now this room though, you'd think this was HVAC equipment. This is actually their fresh air system. This is your uh, Renew Air ERVs. We've got like three big ones and a small one here. And then all the pipes that we saw in the building are not all the pipes. A lot of the pipes that we saw in the building are strictly for fresh air. And these are energy recovery ventilators. So they're bringing in fresh air. They're exhausting the stale air out of the building. They're exchanging the heat. So if it's super cold in the winter, it's tempering that. And it's also tempering the moisture loads as well. That's what an ERV does compared to a heat recovery ventilator. Very cool space. Sarah, I love getting behind the scenes and seeing the mechanicals. Let's move on from energy, which isn't easy, but you've done some things that I've seen before, let's say. Yeah. And let's talk about water efficiency. This, this basically could be a uh, net water building as well, right? Yeah, we are net positive water, exactly. And just like energy, that's saying, okay, we can't use more water than we could produce on site. Mm -hmm. And any water that we use in the building, we need to put back on site. <laughs> so we've sort of just borrowed some water in the middle, used it for our own purposes, cleaned it up, and then put it back into the landscape. Whew, okay, so that starts with what we can see here, which is rainwater collection. Pretty standard. Yep. A lot of people have done that. Uh, you know, the rain is being harvested into these two uh, reservoirs, two cisterns, reservoirs on either end of the building. But then it gets a little more interesting, doesn't it? Talk to me about both your uh, kind of internal plumbing system and your gray water system. Yeah, so our, our internal plumbing system, uh, this building is designed to be able to use that rainwater. Um, due to some regulation issues, we're not currently using that rainwater right now, but we have metered that we are not using more water in the building than we can collect from these, from these cisterns. So we okay. know that our water footprint is still within the bounds of the site. Yep. And then if you look at our gray water system, um, because we have these amazing composting toilets in the building, the only water that we end up using in, in this building is gray water. That's so we are amazing. actually able to treat that water in our building using uh, plants. There's basically no septic or, new, or no sewer system on this building. Like most houses <laughs> have a main sewer pipe that everything flows through and goes out to a municipal treatment plant. This building doesn't have that, does yeah, it? Yeah, we have no sewer connection. It's all, it all happens from inside the house. That is wild. Let's go down in the basement and we're gonna show you the composting toilets. Sarah, this looks like any other bathroom I've ever been in. Huh, all right, well, you, for the most part, but I invite you to uh, open the lid there, okay. have a look. Let just me, let me have know what my, you see. Just happen to have my flashlight with me. Okay, well, keep a grip on that. What? <laughs> <laughs> There's not a splash of water. Yeah, this is a no splash zone. So I, our... I feel like I'm at a national park. This is basically an outhouse, isn't it? Yeah, but smell it. I don't smell anything. Exactly. And I'm hearing a noise like there's wind happening here. Yeah, so these are our composting toilets, waterless composting toilets. And that wind you feel is actually negative pressure ventilation. So we're pulling ah. air from the bathroom down into our composting So that's why I'm not basement. smelling anything probably, exactly right? Because we've got anything. negative airflow going down through the toilets. Yep. All the time or just when I'm in the bathroom? All the time. And that is why this lid tells you to please shut the lid because we do not uh, need to ventilate yeah. our entire building through the toilet. Got it. Wow. All right, Sarah, so we've seen the systems. Pretty amazing, I gotta say. It, it blows my mind as a builder that's built a lot of what I consider high performance buildings. This is really beyond that. So we've talked energy efficiency, we've talked water and resource efficiency. Talk to me about the, the carbon and the kind of local sourcing and building practices here that are a little different than maybe a lot of commercial buildings that are built. Yeah, so there's a big material story when it comes to living building challenge projects. Um, you know, if you break down the materials pedal, it requires looking at things like local sourcing, like you said, at the carbon footprint. So we calculate the whole carbon footprint of the entire building mm -hmm. and start with an offset at the beginning of construction. Um, also involves looking at uh, material health. So making sure that every build, every material in this building is safe for the people in the building, safe for the people making that product, installing it. Um, and that requires us to know the all the ingredients of every single material uh, wow. in this project, which as you might know, is actually not as easy to find out wow. as you might think. There's no nutrition facts for building products. 
And you gave me a couple examples on the tour of things like, hey, when I ordered the, you know, the big ass fans that were upstairs, instead of just getting one with a plastic, you know, fan blade, you get the metal fan blades, right? Because now we know what it's made from and that it's non-toxic. Yep. And things like, hey, when we, uh, all the beautiful wood that's in there, which happens to be Nordic timbers that Benson would fabbed for you. Yep. When it came time to stain or seal those, you really spent a lot of time and effort thinking about what was going to happen there, right? Yeah. So. I mean, what you just said, part of it is just really simplifying the materials palette to things that we've been using for hundreds of years and we yeah. know are safe, yeah. like wood. Like wood. And then using some of these new products, like the, the Polyway from Vermont Natural Coatings, it's a polyurethane that is made from whey, a byproduct of cheese. Wow. Um, you could probably eat it, although I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> but it's a perfectly safe product and it works better than you know what our what our painting guys were used to using that's really cool tell me a little bit about those timbers you know when you look at the timbers on the inside of the building they're so striking it's such a beautiful building and my understanding is that these walls that we're seeing like where the rw Kern center sign is those are basically kind of residential framed walls and in, in a lot of aspects uh, a double stud wall with cellulose dense pack i totally get my brain around that yeah with exterior wood sheathing that's been um you know, treated really uh, responsibly in terms of both water uh, and air infiltration. You yep. guys use the ProSco R Guard system, which is awesome, um, and also happens to be uh, red list free, right? So they, they've done a really good job of ProSco of making sure that their products don't have things in them uh, that wouldn't meet Living Building Challenge certification. Right. So I get my head around that, but tell me about those timbers. You know, they, they look different than a solid wood timber. What am I looking at there? Yeah, so those are glue laminated timbers, glue lam. And you're right, they're from, they're from Nordic Lamb and put together by our friends at Benson Wood. And so we decided to have a structural timber frame as opposed to something like concrete or steel, partially because of that carbon footprint. You know, mm -hmm. wood sequesters carbon. Yep, uh, sucks it up as the tree grows. Exactly, it does it naturally. Um, and also partially because it's beautiful. You know, mm -hmm. we can leave that timber frame exposed in the structure and we didn't have to pay for, you know, gypsum to cover it up or other finishes. It can be what it is and be a beautiful timber frame. Yeah, that's amazing. So what did I miss on the pedals? What, uh, what pedal did I, uh, did we not talk about that we need to hit? You know, we didn't talk at all about site. Okay, which, let's talk about that. Or place, which I think is, is pretty important. Um, so one of the things Living Building Challenge asks is, where is it even responsible to put a building? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we know, I'm sure you know as a builder, you don't put a building in the middle of a wetland. Right. It's generally bad. Makes sense, yeah. <laughs> um, but Living Building Challenge is also asking us to think about uh, how do people get there? Do people only drive cars there? Is there a bus nearby? Um, and thinking about what kind of habitat might ne be nearby. Is there a sensitive uh, habitat? So thinking about, okay, how do we want to use this site and what's the highest and best use of a site? Yeah. A lot of time, it is a building. Let me ask you a hard question, Sarah. Yeah. There's only been a very few other buildings that have gotten certified. What's that, what is the hurdle, do you think, to seeing mass adoption of a living building challenge? I think part of the part of the barrier sense to living buildings is just it's so holistic and it's so new. It's challenging us to think about buildings a little bit differently, mm -hmm. not as just containers for people, but as positive influences. And yeah. that's a total departure from how we might think about buildings. Um, and it's also it's aspirational. You know, there are there are a lot of hard things about building yeah. a living building, but that's in its that's in its whole package. There are certainly pieces that you can pull from a living building that you might want to use on your own home. Like anyone can capture rainwater and use it to water their gardens. Yep. Um, if you're building a new home, you could think about using composting toilets. You could think about using solar on the roof. Um, people are already thinking about incorporating you know, high performance wall assemblies mm -hmm. in their own homes and thinking about how that improves performance. So it's not all or nothing. Yeah. Such an inspirational building, Sarah. If people are interested in touring this, uh, yeah. the RW Kern Center, uh, or seeing this firsthand, they're in Boston visiting, they want to come see you, uh, see the building, how can people uh, learn more about it, either in person or online? Yeah, so people can go to the RW Kern Center website at Hampshire College, and we'll put, we'll put the link, link in below. here. Awesome. Um, I'm always giving tours, and we can also give 
give private tours. If anyone, you know, you can reach out to me personally. My contact info is on the website. And we've been doing a lot of virtual tours recently, too. So even if you're a little bit further away, I can lure you in for a tour. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much for having me out. What an amazing building. And guys, Sarah and I actually made the director's cut, the extended version of this that we're gonna throw up soon. So stay tuned for the long version if you want more about this. And we actually might make a few more videos about some of the specific systems. Hard for us to go into all this, but I wanted to inspire you to see what could be done in buildings. And I think a lot of what you're seeing here, if you're watching this video 10 years from now, this, some of this might, might be code, might be normal, might be uh, not out of the ordinary like it is a little bit today. Would you agree? Yeah, I hope so. Sarah, do you know how I end these videos, right? I, I do. Guys, if you're not currently a subscriber, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content here every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.